God bless you, Melanie. Good morning, good morning. Thank you, Linda Baker, for that. Especially dedicated to Melanie Coggins this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we welcome you and acknowledge that you were here before we were. This is a place you've promised to reside in, not just visit from time to time. So very thankful for that, Holy Spirit. We treasure you above everything, Lord God. Without your presence, we just make noise and babble. Thank you so much, Lord God, for what Pastor Darren has in store for us, as you have shared with him. We Thank you so much, Lord God, for the amazing experience of worshiping you together publicly, unashamedly, joyfully. And Father, we acknowledge that you have done so much for us, so many things. We celebrate again, Lord God, your amazing prophesied resurrection thrills us, Lord, and fills us with so much hope and energy. We thank you, Lord, for this time of year that we get to celebrate this publicly. But Lord God, how it carries on, how you continue it in our hearts and our minds all year long, this incredible resurrection power of yours. Thank you for how you have resurrected us. Thank you for how you have saved us, adopted us. Thank you for how you love us. We bring ourselves before you this morning, Lord God, always wanting to hear from you, but, in, but especially now wanting you to hear from us. As we worship you, Lord God, we open the eyes and ears and hearts of our spirits. We sing to you from our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
If you love him, sing this to him. Hear these praises from a grateful heart. Each time I think of you, the praises start. Love you so much, Jesus. Love you so much. How my soul longs for you, longs to worship you forever. just to yourself, just go, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah, I do love you, Lord. I love you, God. Okay, so, and if you do want to worship him and bring some joy to his heart this morning, let me hear you say, yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. Now, if you really want the neighbors to hear, (laughs) shout it, okay? Somebody, who's got Psalm 33 memorized? Oh, really? <laughs> Mike, Michael Blachey has, um, isn't it cool to have him up on the drums? Yeah. Okay, Psalm 33 says, It is fitting to praise the Lord your God. And it says, play, and it, I'll paraphrase, it says, Play him with the guitar, <laughs> play him with the drums, make some noise and all that kind of stuff. And it says, and at the very end it says, joyfully shout for joy unto the Lord. Shout for joy unto the Lord. Psalm 33, okay? Okay, so, all right, shout. It doesn't say murmur. I wanted to read this, and it said, it said murmur depressingly to the Lord. No. Shout for joy, okay? So put your inhibitions away just a little bit. And have a sense of what God is saying to us in his word about worship. Shout for joy, okay? So let's go, yes, 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 nice and loud. Yes, yes, yes. Did God breathe into us his breath? Yes, yes, yes. Has God defeated? sin and death yes 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 did god appear as christ on earth yes 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 did jesus save us by his worth yes 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 shout for 
joy unto the Lord. His love endures forever. Shout for joy unto the Lord. His love endures forever. Did God forgive us of our sins? Yes, yes, yes. Had no beginning and no end. Yes, yes, yes. Did God reveal to us his plan? Yes, yes, yes. Did God show mercy unto man? Yes, yes, yes. Shout for joy unto the Lord. His love endures forever. Shout for joy unto Shout. His love endures forever. Unto you, O oh Lord, we shout to give you all the glory unto you oh lord we shout to you our hearts we raise unto you oh lord we shout to tell the world your story unto you oh lord we shout our worship and our praise did jesus rise up from the grave Yes, 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 hallelujah. To us his Holy Spirit gave. Yes, yes, yes. Are we his children by his grace? Yes, yes, yes. In heaven will we see his face? Yes, yes, yes. Shout for joy unto the Lord. His love endures forever. Shout for all the glory unto you oh lord we shout to you our hearts we raise unto you oh lord we shout tell the world your story unto you oh lord we shout our worship and our praise unto you oh lord unto you oh lord we shout Hallelujah. A new one. We're going to do that one Resurrection Sunday, just so, you're, just so you're ready. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the joy that comes from knowing. Somehow, Holy Spirit, you are able to make it known to us as only you can. No word or no claim from any other would do that for us. It's only because you have said it. It's only because you have done it. Only you could. We just recognize your power. We, do, we bow down before your glory. We admit our sins. We know we're not worthy. And yet, and yet what you did, what you did, you did it for us. How extraordinary for each of us to know that if we were the only one, you'd have done all this for us. It makes us love you so much, Lord God. We love you, Lord God. Thank you for doing what you did, what you continue to do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. When Jesus did what he did, when Jesus said what he said, 
When he gave what he gave, when he Children are dismissed for Sunday school, and let's pray for Pastor Darren. Father God, thank you so much for your servant, Pastor Darren. We continue in our worship, Lord, as he shares with us what you've shared with him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hi, saints. How are you? Good to see you again after not being with you last week. It's great to be back. Excited to be with you again today. I was walking around the hospital the other day, butchering his eyes on the sparrow. <laughs> and uh, it's so cool that you played that this morning. I love that song. Yeah. Why should I be discouraged? Yes, that's a great, great song. Maybe we can sing that. Yeah, that's one of your best. So what if it went downhill after that one. <laughs> I just, it's a great song. Oh, man. So I was, um, my first job out of high school, I worked at a Sambo's restaurant. Who remembers Sambo's? Yeah. We're all a little, most of us are a little, little older. 
For those of you who don't know, Sambo's are kind of like Denny's. Yeah, I wash dishes at a Sambo's. And back then, I, uh, I had to work grave shifts sometimes. And back then, you'd get the bar rush at like 2.30, right? When the bars would shut down, everyone would come to get breakfast, and it would get crazy busy. And I remember my first week when I had to work grave shifts on a weekend. Um, one night, I just got completely buried in the back. Waitresses needed dishes, glassware, coffee cups, and I was by myself, and the dishes were piling up, and I was panicking, and I didn't know what I was going to do, and it was bad news. I can remember, um, I can remember this night really well because of what happened next, and I remember just being really, really anxious. Like I was almost ready to just walk out. I was so overwhelmed, and I had a manager, a nighttime manager. I've often wondered what happened to him. His name was Lanny. It's 40 years ago now, but I'll never forget Lanny grabbed an apron. We had one of those, those old, they weren't leather. I don't know what they were. They were waterproof aprons. They were brown. They were ugly. And he grabbed one off the rack, and he put an apron on, and he says, you go out and bring the dishes back. I'll wash them. You just shuttle them back and forth, and I'll wash them. And I just, that, I still remember that. What an impact that made on me that my boss, a guy he could have just sat in the office or back then everybody still smoked in the restaurant business. You'd walk into the office and it'd be like, whew. Uh, Lanny was a smoker. I can still remember him washing dishes with that cigarette hanging out of his mouth. It somehow made him look cooler. <laughs> But I'll never forget Lanny getting down there in the dirt with me, right? In the suds and the water and in the syrup and the pancake batter and you name it. I'll never forget my boss putting an apron on and getting down there in the muck and the mire with me. That had a huge impact on me. I still remember it. Bosses that aren't afraid to get their hands dirty are pretty cool. People in charge, leaders who aren't afraid to get down there with the, with the workers and get dirty, that, that makes an impact when you come down to our level. And in a sense, when we talk about God with us, God coming down, becoming a human being, there's something similar in that to Lanny helping me wash dishes that night. He didn't have to do it. And it, yet he chose to save me, if you will, by getting down on my level and experiencing what I experienced so that I could make it through. Now, don't push that analogy too far because like all analogies, it'll break down. But God is like that. When you think about what he did in Jesus Christ, there's something similar to that. God gets down on our level. God becomes one of us. He takes on human flesh. I don't think we can get our minds wrapped around that sufficiently. That's craziness. That God would say, you know what? I'm going to experience what it's like to feel hunger. I'm going to experience what it's like to get thirsty. I'm going to experience what it's like to catch a cold. I'm going to experience what it's like to have my heart broken and to feel rejection. I'm going to experience all that with my people so that they could never say that I don't understand. I don't know what it's like. And in that experience, I'm going to save them from the curse that they're under. I'm going to deliver them from the bondage to sin and death that they find themselves in. I love that song because we sang that one of the lines in that song we sang, Rob, says that very thing. Did he come to set us free from sin and death? Yes, yes, yes. It's exactly what he came to do. This is what God came to do in the person of Jesus. We've been traveling through the Bible heading towards Easter weekend. We've talked about the fall in Genesis, the problem that occurred separation from God as a result of sin entering into the world. We talked about Abraham and Isaac and how God showed Abraham that day on the mountain, Mount Moriah, 
that it is by faith we are saved. If we simply believe that God will deliver us, he does. Requires no work on our behalf. There's no effort that needs to be made by us in order to be delivered by him. He does that on our behalf. We just have to believe And then Rob talked about the prophets and the prophecies that spoke of someone who would come, a Messiah, a Savior, a Savior, who would deliver us somehow, some way from the mess we had created. And so now as we get closer to Resurrection Sunday, I'm going to spend some time in the book of John. It's a book, of course, that most, if not all of you, are very familiar with. We're going to spend some time in the very first chapter And talk a little bit what it means about God with us, Emmanuel, right? God with us. What it means that God gets down on our level. He puts the apron on. He gets dirty in order to save us from separation from him. John chapter 1. Now that's a good place to pray, right? Let's pray. God... Praise you, Lord. We thank you, God, for your word. And again, like, I, like we pray every week, uh, we, we don't need a word from me. Nobody needs a word from Darren. That's just, just opinion, just like everybody else's. God, we need a word from you. Speak through me, Holy Spirit, and encourage your people. I know that's what you want to do, God. You want to encourage your people. Send them out of here, God, joyous with the good news of what you did in Jesus, and you are happy to do it, and happy to do it still. In your name we pray, amen. So we're going to start a little bit lower down in the chapter. John chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 9. We're going to begin in verse 9, and it says this. John, this is the disciple John. This is the disciple John, the brother of James. He says, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his very own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Now, the disciple John has just told us, we have to set up the context, right? The uh, the disciple John, it can get a little bit confusing. The disciple John has just told us that John the Baptist, that's a different John. He's just told us that John the Baptist was not the light of men. That's not who John the Baptist was. John the Baptist was not the light that came to shine into the darkness. You remember, did you touch on this, Rob? I might have should have touched base with you. Uh, last week, did you mention Isaiah 9, too, by any chance? Behold, those who are in darkness will see a great light. It's one of the great prophecies in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah chapter 9, where Isaiah says, one day, those of us who are in the dark are going to be enlightened. The lights will come on. The light will show up. We know that, of course, is Jesus. I am the light of the world. We talked about that a few weeks back. But again, John is saying John the Baptist is not that person. John the Baptist is not the one who came to bring life. No, John the Baptist came to get us ready for the light. John the Baptist came to set the stage for one, like John says, John the Baptist himself says, who is greater than I, one who whose sandals I'm not even fit to tie. This is what John the Baptist did. He set the stage. He got us ready for the one we've been waiting for, the Messiah, the Christos, the Christ, Jesus. John the Baptist came to testify about the light. But John says, the one who came, the one who John the Baptist got us ready for, He is the true light, the one who enlightens every man. You ever been in the dark? My son, my uh, 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 the bedroom light in Jackson's room has got a little short in the switch, and Jackson has the magic magic touch. He can flick the switch enough to get the light to come on. 
And so he hears me in there when he's getting ready to go to bed and I'm knocking my knees against things and banging stuff and trying to figure out stuff in the dark. And Jackson will get up there and fiddle that switch and the light will come on. It's like, oh, wow, how much nicer is that? This is what Jesus does for the world. He brings light into darkness and we can see. And a lot of times when you're dark, you don't even realize how dark it is until the light bursts in and you go, oh, wow, this is amazing. This is what the light does for us. He brings truth. He brings life. We've, I, you know, I, that's one of those horses that I beat to death and I will always continue to to hammer that point home that over and over again in the New Testament, we see that Jesus came to bring life. He wants you to have life. And he was, doesn't want you to just have any life. He wants you to have life to the fullest, life more abundantly. Jesus is a life giver. He's not a, he's not a boring guy that just wants you to be obedient and just you know, do what I tell you to do. Jesus wants you to have life to the fullest. That's what he created you for. Joy that comes with that, of course. He brings life. He brings light to the world. And we've been waiting. We've been waiting. The Bible has been setting up this story. We've been waiting for someone who deliver us. Moses did okay, but he fell short. Abraham did okay, but he fell short. David did okay, but he fell short. All of these these people that, that pointed towards someone who would not fall short. Someone who would get the job done. Waiting for a Messiah. And John says that the true light came to the world. The very world that he created. The very world that he created. He decided to get down there with. And the world for the most part didn't recognize him. John says that, yeah. That's right. Yeah, he came to bring life. He didn't come to bring death. He came to deliver us and save us. Bring us out of the darkness where we had placed ourselves. Jesus came to his very own people and they didn't listen to him. They rejected him. His very people rejected him, and it broke Jesus' heart. And then in verse 12, John continues, But, but, but as many as who did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believed, he said, we are one once again. We are family once again. We have been reunited once again. To those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. But again, those who did see him, those who did accept him, those who did believe him, receive him. He gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe the truth. They were given what? New birth. Do you see it? Not birth biologically, John says. You weren't given new birth biologically. You were given new birth spiritually. Not of the flesh. That's biological birth. You do that one time. But new birth spiritually. What was the problem? We were no longer family. We were separated from God in our sin. And Jesus came to repair that, to reconcile that, so that we would once again be his children. He didn't decide we weren't going to be his children. We decided that we weren't going to be his children. We made the mess. We created the problem. When we allowed sin to enter in, and the entire world was cursed as a result of it, but God says, I'll fix it. I've got to fix it. I'm the only one who can fix it. This is how I will fix it. Because I am not going to allow my most beloved creation not to have fellowship with me. 
I will do whatever I have to do, God says, in order to save my people. That's what he does. Yes, that's what he does. I am not going to leave them there. No, I am going to deliver them. They are my children. They are going to be my children once again. No matter how hard they try to screw it up, I am going to save my people. That's what I do. That's who God is. He is a saver. He is a redeemer. He is a rescuer. When you find, now I'm, now I'm, I'm here I go. When you find yourself in times of trouble and adversity and suffering and tragedy and you wonder how you'll ever make it out, I don't know, but I know this. God is a redeemer. God is a rescuer. God is a saver. That is what he is in the business of doing. I don't know how he's going to work it out. I don't know how he's going to fix the problem. But know this, when you lay your head down on your pillow that you might be soaking in your tears. Even if you've got to shout it to the ceiling, God, you are a saver. You are a redeemer. That is what you do. And I'm praying that you will do it again in my life. And there is no way that God looks at that prayer and says, yeah, no, nope, not this time. No way. This is what he does for his people. And in verse 14, John continues. This one, this one who has come, who has come to bring light and life, the creator of the world, the word John calls him became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory glory as of the only begotten from the father full of grace and truth that is such a beautiful wonderful verse there's so much there and then in parenthetically he says John testified, that is, John the Baptist testified about him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. You can go back now, though, to 14. This is where we'll camp out. John says the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. If you go back, if you've got your Bibles, if you don't, that's okay. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was, is God, and the Word became flesh. God John is telling us very plainly, became a human being. God became a human being. And I've mentioned this before. He became human to give us back our humanity. He became human to give us back our humanity. When you sin, when you get down in the muck and the mire of the flesh... And you do things that you used to do before that you know better now. And yet sometimes you still return to it. I've told you this is true. You are acting subhuman. This is not how we were intended to be. This was not how we were intended to behave. Right? That's subhuman. Jesus is the perfect example of what, who we were created to be. Jesus was and is what it means to be really human. All those, think about his miracles. What is he doing when he restores sight to the blind man? What is he doing when he makes the lame man walk? When he raises Lazarus from the dead? On and on. Think of the miracles. What is he doing? He's restoring what? Humanity. He's making it right. Exactly. He's changing things back to the way they were supposed to be. He dwelt among us. You know what that means in the Hebrew? He dwelt means he set up a tent. He tabernacled with us. I'm going to read Revelation 21.3 to you quickly. I should be able to find it. It's the last book in the Bible, right? 
Listen to this, a beautiful vision. John, same John, same John who wrote John, wrote Revelation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. This is his vision of glory at the end. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain the first things have passed away. This is what it means when God dwells among his people. Dwelling among us doesn't just mean uh, that he's with us. It doesn't just mean he's there in our presence. It signifies intimacy. It signifies relationship. It signifies like that day Lanny got the the, 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 the apron on and got in there with me and in, in the muck and the mire and the dirt of real life. That's what it means when God dwells with his people. He's, he's in it with us. Let me get down here and live and experience life like you do with you. We worship a God. This is what I have many friends of different religious traditions. I have some wonderful Mormon friends who I've met in chaplaincy. Wonderful human beings. A Hindu man that I talk with and have lunch with occasionally. Not talking about their, 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 who they are as people. But, but, but they do not worship a God like we do. And I'm not here to tell them they're wrong. It's all beside the... I'm telling you, nobody's God is like our God. Because we are the only ones who worship a God who got down here with us. That is shameful to them. They would never accept a God who would take on human flesh, become one of us, and get down here with us. What kind of God does that? My God. Your God, that's what kind of God does that. That's who my God is. My God wrapped himself with this stuff and got down here with us. That's what John says came. Who God, or John says came. And John says we saw his glory as one who was begotten by the Father. We, we've talked about this before. When you think of, and this is difficult to teach your kids. Those of you who teach kids have a hard job. What does it mean to be the only begotten son? You know, it's easy. I remember once, I'll never forget when Jackson said, well, God is Jesus' daddy. And I was like, mm, yeah, no. You know, it's tough. To, that's a tough concept to get. But begotten doesn't mean like give birth to. Begotten means come from out of. And so when we see the son, he has come out of the father. Don't ask me how they remain one. I, the metaphysical, philosophical stuff is for another time. But, but, but that's what it means to be begotten. Jesus has come from out of the father. One with the father, out of the father, not less than, don't think of God on the throne and Jesus on the little seat next to him. No, 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 no. Jesus is on the throne. One God. We worship one God. We are monotheistic. But this is what it means to be begotten. He has come from the Father for us. His glory. What do you think of when you think of God's glory? Someone says, hey, you know, describe God's glory. What might you say? What, might, what picture might you have? Maybe you would have that time when Elijah called down fire from heaven, right? That seems like God's glory. Lightning bolts, storm, tornado, God's glory. I think of a booming voice that makes the mountains shake, right? It, if someone asks you, hey, you're, we're going to give you an unlimited budget, 
and, and you're going to make a movie, and the first opening scene, you're going to show God's glory. Man, who knows what you might do, but it would probably be impressive, right? It would be loud. The theater would shake. This is what we think of when we think of God's glory. Look at Exodus 33, if you have it. Do, do, do any of you remember off the top of your head what happens in Exodus 33? Why can't I find Exodus? Do any, so the, the people have worshipped the golden calf. And God is upset. And he's called Moses up to the mountain. And he says, Moses, I'm going to deal with the people. You remember what Moses does? And this is a month's worth of sermons. And Moses intercedes for the people, doesn't he? He's a type of Jesus, right? He's a type. He's one who points towards the Messiah. He intercedes on behalf of the people. And God says, I'm not going. In fact, boy, this is shit. You, you'll handle this in Bible study, right, Barry, John? The Bible says God repents. It says he changes his mind. I'll throw that to you. At any rate, God changes things. God says, okay, you interceded for your people, for the people, and I'm going to not do what I appeared ready to do. And Moses is so moved by God's mercy and by God's grace. He says what? He says, show me your what? Show me your glory. Um, where is it? 18. Thank you. Then Moses said, I pray you. Thank you. Show me your glory. And God said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. What is God's glory? What most exemplifies God? Moses says, show me your glory, God. And God says, I will. What most shows God off? What does he say? I will make all my goodness pass before you. What is God's glory? It's his goodness. It's his goodness. That is his glory. It is his grace. And it is his mercy. That's what he tells Moses. He's going to show him when Moses says, show me how great you are. Show me how mighty you are. Show me who at your very essence you are. And God says, okay, I will. I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will be merciful to whom I will be merciful. And a little later down in Exodus 34, verse six. Then the Lord passed by in front of Moses and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. That's how God showed his glory. That's not how I'm doing it in the movie. Right? That's not how we might expect God to show off. And yet that's what he reveals to Moses. Jesus came, John says, to show us that. That glory that Moses saw on the mountain that day was the same glory that John and the disciples and the people saw when Jesus came. That same glory, because that is who God is. That is who Jesus is. You want to know what God looks like? You want to know how God would act, how God would respond? Look at Jesus. Jesus came to show us that glory. 
verse 16, for all of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. And if he would have written some more, he would have said upon grace, upon grace, upon grace ad infinitum. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. Jesus has explained him. Jesus has revealed him. We had a problem too in that God is invisible, right? How can we really trust what we haven't seen? The Bible itself acknowledges here how hard that can be. How can we trust what we haven't seen? And so he came. God came in living color, in flesh and blood. And John says, when they saw Jesus, they saw God. And when you open your eyes, church, when you open or when you close your eyes the last time here, whenever that may be, and you open your eyes there, wherever there may be, for the first time, you will, we sang that too, you will see God. And it will be the face of a Palestinian man born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. There might even be some scars around the top of his head. I don't know how badly they jammed that thorn of crown, that crown of thorns down. There may be some scars that you see, certainly still in the palm of his hands. And he will say, hi, John. Hi, Barry. Hi, Kathy. Hi, Robert. Welcome home. That same man you will see face to face because he was and is God in the flesh. God has a face and you will see it. And it will be the same face that John saw when he was introduced to Jesus for the first time. The same face. He says, law was given by Moses. The standard, the measuring stick, right? Our calling. This, was, this is what we were expected to meet. The law. This is what we were intended to fulfill before sin entered in. And we became marred and broken. Moses brought that. But grace and truth came with God, came with Jesus. The law showed us what we were intended to be. And when we looked at it, we saw how separated and how incapable we were of meeting it. Remember the problem. The problem was not all the bad things you've done. The problem is who you are at the core before we are united with Christ. And so God himself comes and he fulfills the law in our place. And he sends his spirit to re uh, invigorate to revive to rebirth us so that we can fulfill our calling now there's no more excuse right we can't say oh i can't do it yeah you can sometimes you choose not to but by all means you have the power now to say no to sin you are no longer we've we've talked about that a lot you are no longer in bondage to it Whenever you sin now, it's because you choose to. And by the way, you know when I say you, I got four fingers pointing back at me. Whenever I choose to sin, whenever I choose to go back to the muck and the mire of that stuff, it's because I decide to listen to my flesh, not the spirit. But it no longer holds me in, in, in bondage like it used to. I've been set free from that. He empowers us now. He stays with us. He says to his disciples, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to send the comforter. I'm going to be with you always. He didn't just tabernacle with us then. He tabernacles with us now. He has made you his temple. Yeah. We have the living God in us. 
One of my favorite verses, again, we toss it out week to week, right? Ephesians 3. The same power that is in you, the same power that God used to raise Christ from the dead, the same power lives in us. God has shown up. Jesus showed up and has revealed. He has explained who God is. He has shown us in his very body who God is. He has brought God, John says, into full view. And God doesn't just want to fill you with knowledge, by the way, about truth and grace. He wants you to experience it. He doesn't want you to just walk out of here today and go, okay, that was interesting. Yeah, okay, I know that. I see that now. It's good to know. Yeah, no, I want you to experience it, he would say. Yeah, it is good to know that. But if you just know it and you don't put it into practice, you don't take advantage of it, what good is it? He would say, I want you to live it. I want you to experience it. I want you to have life and life to the fullest. And the only way you're going to do that is if you grasp the truth of what I did. And the power that I have given you in my very presence in you, in the spirit. A guy named Richard Sibbs wrote this. He said, Christ is nothing but pure grace clothed with our nature. Christ is nothing but pure grace clothed with our nature. In Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29 says this, take my yoke upon you, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I am gentle and humble in heart. I want to read something to you. From a book that I saw back on your table one time entitled Gentle and Lowly. And if you want to come talk to me after and write this down, I would highly recommend this book is dynamite. Listen to what the author says about that. Merciful and gracious. These are the first words out of God's own mouth after proclaiming his name to Moses on the mountain. I am merciful and gracious. The first words. Words. The only two words Jesus will use to describe his own heart here in Matthew 11, when, when he describes himself, what does he say? I am gentle and I am lowly. The first two words God uses to describe who he is are merciful and gracious. God does not reveal his glory as the Lord, the Lord, exacting and precise. Or the Lord, the Lord, Tolerant and overlooking. Or the Lord, the Lord, disappointed and frustrated. His highest priority and deepest delight and first reaction. God's heart is merciful and gracious. He gently accommodates himself to our terms rather than overwhelming us with his. He doesn't demand that we somehow reach his level. He comes down to ours. He doesn't demand that you somehow reach his level. He comes down to ours. When you have a little two-year-old at home or a one-year-old at home who's learning to crawl on the floor, you don't stand there and yell at him, get up. Come on, mow the grass. Do what you're supposed to do. You get down there on his or her level, don't you? You get down there on the floor and you talk baby talk to him or her. And you get down on their level because you love them. That's what God does to, for us in Jesus. So three points as we close. Challenge to you to remember today. There's no termination date on Jesus' commitment to you. It never runs out. He's never sick of you or tired of you. He's not like us. Remember that famous verse we like to say a lot, God's ways are not your ways. 
right? We quote it a lot. You know what that verse is in the context of? Read it in Isaiah. He says, you, you, you don't forgive. You hold grudges. You get even. You get payback. I don't. I forgive because my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I'm altogether different than you are. I get down on your level. His commitment to us never runs out. You can't eliminate his grace. You can't outrun his mercy. You can't evade his goodness. He pursues you. He runs hard after you. And he waits for you. Just like the dad in the prodigal son story. When are you going to get tired of it? When are you going to come get back to the life giver? There's no termination date on his commitment to you. Two, although Jesus became like us, he was and is altogether different too. And it's important to remember that as well. It's important to remember that as well. He isn't like us too. He's like us, but he isn't like us. Even the most intense of human love is but the faintest echo of heaven's cascading abundance. His heartful thoughts for you outstrip what you can even conceive. In fact, that's what Paul says in his letter. Um, man, goodness gracious, I just forgot. Where is it? It's in Ephesians 2, isn't it? I don't know Ephesians chapter 2, but it's in the book of Ephesians when he says, I can't even put into words how much God loves you. I can't even, Paul says, I can't describe in human language how much God loves you. He intends to restore you into the radiant resplendence for which you were created. And that is dependent not on you keeping yourself clean, but on you taking your mess to him. I love that. It doesn't depend on you. Don't, don't you let anybody, I, I, do you get, people drive me crazy. You know, I'm going to clean up my act and come to church. Why are you going to clean up your act? No, you're not. You, that's the whole point. You can't clean up your act. Just come to church. I mean, and not that I'm this big legalist where you got to come. I'm, you know what I'm saying? That's what the church is. It's a bunch of whole messy people who haven't cleaned up their acts. Right? I haven't cleaned up my act. Oh, my goodness gracious. God has so much yet to do in me and through me. I am a mess. I've shared with you some of my struggles and my stuff. I don't have any problem admitting that to you. Oh, my goodness. We, we're all jacked up. We've all got issues. We pull bags full of issues and garbage with us. And God says, hey, man, it's not like I don't want you to have it, but bring it. What, you don't think I know? You don't think I don't know what you do when you're all by yourself? You don't think I don't know what you're thinking about in the car? The anger, the resentment, the bitterness, the hurt, the pain? I, what, you don't think I don't know? God says, bring it. Let's deal with it. I don't love you any less because you're a mess. I adore you in your messiness. And again, I'm not, you, you guys know, I'm not sitting here saying that God loves it when we, that, that, we're, that we're hurting and that we've got issues. No, but God not, doesn't keep him from loving us. He's not disappointed in you. I get mad at the theologians and sometimes the preachers I listen to now that give you the impression that God is so disappointed in you. No, that's my mother. <laughs> Bless, I love my mother. And she's not disappointed in me. I said, now she's going to watch this and be hot. <laughs> right? That's what we do. Right? We do, I do that to my kid all the time. I'm jacking my son up. He's going to have issues later because of my parenting. So what we just do. We just pass it along. Right? God, oh, yeah, he, just, he adores you with all of our stuff. And finally, lastly, Jesus cares for you even in your failures now. Read one more passage out of Romans. I've probably gone on too long. Romans 5, 6 and 11. For while we were still helpless, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for those who had their act together. He didn't die for those who, he didn't come and die for those who, who, who already followed him. 
who already understood him completely know. One would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare to die. But God, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we will be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He is still in the redeeming business. He is still in the reconciling business. Yeah, we've been saved once and for all spiritually from separation from him in his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. But we've still got our stuff, don't we? Because of that thing called the flesh. So he doesn't stop working. He doesn't stop reconciling. The Bible says, Barry, John, I love The Bible says he's up there interceding for us. He prays for us. Like, what? How does the, the son, the father, but you are the father. How? I don't know. But, the, but Jesus is still up there cheering for you. I don't know how else to describe it, right, John? He's, he's your biggest fan. He's interceding for you. Insert your name here. I know it's been a rough day. I know it's been a rough week, a rough year, a rough season. I'm your biggest fan. And with me, we're going to bring you through this. Hold on. Hold on. I'm interceding for you. I'm praying for you. Heck, the Bible says, Paul, man, I'm riffing now. Paul says that even when you pray and your prayers are a mess, that God, Jesus, works them around to where, where is that, Barry? I'll put you, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, where he works them around and he, he makes the prayer what it's actually supposed to be. And you don't even know it. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he intercedes for us. He is your biggest fan. And I'll be darned if I, it, it, people have told me before, you can't tell people that because they'll walk out of the church and they'll think it's okay to sin. That's exactly what you're going to do, right? We're going to preach this message about how wonderful God is in Jesus and you're going to walk out of here and go, yeah, now I can sin as much as I want. That doesn't work that way. No, you love him more and you say, God, I want to please you more, right? I want to, I just... I want to be obedient because I see what you've done for me and I see how it's good for me. You don't walk out of here after hearing about grace and mercy and say, oh, I'm just okay to do whatever I want now. No, that's garbage theology. Nobody does that. We want to be more obedient. We want to live in his faithfulness. We want to walk in his spirit when we hear the message of grace and truth because we see what he's done for us and we see how he's our biggest fan and he wants to give us life. And life to the fullest. Finally, I'll close with this, I promise. The logic of Romans 5 is this. Through his son, he drew near to us when we hated him. Will he remain distant now that we hope we can please him? He eagerly suffered for us when we were failing. When you were an orphan. When you were separated from him, he came to die for us. Will he cross his arms? I love this picture. Will he cross his arms over our failures now that we are his adopted children? Now he's going to get mad? Now he's going to reject you? After all he's gone through to bring you into family with him? His heart was gentle and lowly toward us when we were lost. Will his heart be anything different toward us now that we are found while we were still, he loved us in our mess then. He'll love us in our mess now. Our very agony in sinning is the fruit of our adoption. A cold heart would not be bothered. We are not who we were. You are not who you were. Why? Because God took on flesh, he put on the apron, and he got down in the muck and the mire with us and said, Darren, Donald, Robert, 
Shirley, Kathy, Mary, Susan, I'm not going to leave you here to do this by yourself. I love you too much. And you are going to be my son. You are going to be my daughter. Come hell or high water, I am going to make sure it gets accomplished. That's the God we serve. That's who Jesus is. Amen. God, I... There were no words. And one day when we see you face to face, with a smile on it, with a smile on it, maybe we'll be able to tell you adequately how much we love you. Until then, God, with just our words, will have to suffice, Lord. We love you. We, I, I confess I can't grasp everything I just taught, everything I just said. I, I, don't, I can't fully grasp it. One day, Lord, maybe you'll really reveal it to us in glory and we'll be able to see the magnitude of who you are and what you did and what you still do. Until then, God, encourage us and bless us to serve you in love. Not because we're trying to earn anything, but because we just want to, we, 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 we just want to show off who you are. By loving our neighbor, by loving people, because that's what you do. Bless you, God. Thank you, Jesus. We praise your name. Amen. We singing? Oh, of course. Man, what better? Oh, man. We, now we get to share in the, the body and the blood of Christ. Amen. That's the, yeah. I'm so glad you do communion every week. Hmm. First Corinthians ten sixteen through seventeen is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the same bread. Paul says something in verse 17 we may not often associate with communion. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Communion unites us not only to Christ, but to one another as well. Like spokes on a wheel, we are connected to each other through Christ, the hub of the wheel. In the scriptures, we only see communion taken as a group as the body of Christ, never taken alone. In chapter 11, verses 20 through 22, and 33 through 34, we are told to eat in our individual homes when hungry, but to take the Lord's Supper together as a united body. We jointly as a body, proclaim the Lord's death until he returns whenever we take the cup and eat the bread. This is an interesting aspect of fellowship and communion 
which are intertwined together, and that aspect is not often emphasized. It is one reason why it is so important that if at all possible, you be present whenever the church gathers, whenever the body gathers. Not only is there a vertical aspect to communion, but there is also a horizontal aspect to communion. When we jointly proclaim the Lord's death for our sins. That is why, in years past, you would often hear the Lord's Supper referred to as the fellowship of the Lord's table, or as the meal that unites. Let us pray. Father God, we praise you for the multiple aspects of communion, uniting us to Christ through payment for our sins by his shed blood, for the opportunity to proclaim his atoning death to the world, for uniting us, your people, in fellowship as your body and for the promise of your return. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, saying, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, John. A few announcements and prayer items, and then we'll, then we'll finish up with some worship. So, can you believe Easter's almost here? What's next week? Next Sunday? No, but next Sunday is Palm Sunday. It's here. That's next Sunday. So, get ready. Are you guys ready? So, Easter's coming. A couple things. Um, you know, we're going to have a great service on, the, on you know, both Palm Sunday, but also on Easter Sunday. Um, we've got a, you know, a special children's um, you know, message at the end of the service. And there'll be a, um, a, some, I know Jamie and Robert have got some you know, treasure hunt things for the kids as well. So if you know kids that would enjoy that, invite them. Um, it's a great time. Um, we're also going to have guest speakers, kind of guest speakers. Um, all three of your elders will be preaching on Sunday, Easter Sunday. I was working on that, you know, First John, Second John, and Barry. It doesn't quite ring right. <laughs> I missed it somewhere, but oh well, that's all right. I could, I don't know. I'll, I'll let you be the finisher, and you can explain that. So anyway, but excited, a great Easter Sunday, um, a great time to celebrate. So get ready, prepare for it. Are you reading your devotionals in that? Yesterday's devotional, John chapter 1, it looks, sounds familiar. He talked about God became flesh and dwelt among us. So, yeah, so, yeah spend time with him. Um, got a, um, I guess, other announcements. We got our, another class on, on Sunday school on prayer today, so join us afterwards. I think there were, I saw like chocolate cupcakes in there too. I don't know. I, that looks dangerous. So, but I won't give them away yet, right, Linda? <laughs> All right. Got a few prayer requests I want to bring um, in that. Um, um, obviously, you know, several from our own body. I got an, a message from Steve Benko. We kind of miss him. I miss him sitting over on this side. He sent an email out, I think, to Rob, and then he copied me. Um, he's got 
hernia surgery coming up this Thursday, the 30th, and that. So um, I put it in the church newsletter as well. But um, So he asked us to pray for him. I, I'm assuming this was something he, he'd been kind of waiting on for a while probably. It's not the kind of surgery you just show up and say, I need it now. Um, but anyway, but it's this Thursday. Um, so he asked for prayer um, for that, that it go well. Birthday. Well, I don't know. I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> Why you do surgery on your birthday? But okay. So anyway, yeah. But pray for Steve. We miss him here. But um, in that, um, we want to lift up a couple of our other folks. Um, I know Melanie's going through the struggle. Her, her father passed away this week, and that. So Buddy Coggins um, is no longer with us. He's hopefully with the Lord. But just lift up um, Melanie and her whole family um, into God's presence. That's hard. There's never an easy way to go through that. Um, Ron Murphy is not here with us today. He is up with his mom who's battling cancer. I'm assuming it's near the end. Um, and so really lift up Ron and, and his family as well and present them to God because um, that's a hard time. I've been through it. It's not fun. So, But God will be with them. Um, my brother Arnie continued to pray for him. He had a successful hip surgery, so he's out of pain. That's a great thing. But he's still now he's still dealing with the prostate cancer treatment, so that's the, the, the ongoing prayer for him. Um, um, Sue Berthoff, she's getting better. Have you talked to her lately? She had her first physical therapy on Friday. Oh, good. And she was ready. She, yeah, so good. But continue to pray for Sue. She wants to be back with us, um, but she can't yet. She's really not mobile enough to do that yet, so pray for her full recovery in that. Um, how's your father doing, Linda? <laughs> He's doing better. So Linda's father, Dell, um, from his stroke back in December and that. So he's still getting full recovery. So lots of prayer requests um, in that. And so I want to lift up a few of them now as we pray. And then, um, Rob and Linda, if you want to come up and we'll finish with worship. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to especially lift up those in our church family here that are they're going through different you know, losses and physical issues. I especially pray for the Coggins family and for Melanie, that you would encourage and comfort. Um, we lift them all up to you, bring, bring them into your presence. And then and also be with Ron Murphy as he's um, working with, being with his mom, maybe for the last few weeks or months, we don't know. And I just try and pray for these special people in our family, that you would encourage their hearts. And Father, we know you're with them. We know that you will care for them. But we pray for your encouragement in their heart as they deal with loss and struggle right now. And so we lift all of our church family up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Darren. Thank you, elders. God bless you this morning. Just appreciate so much hearing your voices sing to him. It's, it's kind of strange to look out from this angle and to see God working, to see in faces and in hands raised and knees bowed internally, that he's speaking and people are responding and that there is this joy that comes from being in his presence. Appreciate that in all of you so much. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hail him 
that death may die. Woo, we are on the receiving end of that. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for your love for us. Lord God, we would not be capable of anything without you. We just again acknowledge you, Lord. Again, our spirits and our souls bow down before you, Lord God. What we cannot see with the physical eye, our spirits can. And it causes us to bow down, Lord, at soul depth, in wonder and amazement at all your glory. Thank you for how much of your glory we are able to see, even though it is just a glimmer at this point. Even that is sufficient to bring us to this wonderful place of adoring you and trusting you and believing you, and loving you. We love you, Lord God, and acknowledge that it's because you've loved us first. We pray these things, Lord God, in your name, the powerful, appeared name of Jesus, and all God's people together said, Amen. God bless you this morning. Ha, ha, ha.